Hello, everyone. We still have a few attendees that are calling in. We're going to give them just a moment or two, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Training for a Consistent Voice on Social Media, featuring our speaker Sophia Champeau, the Public Affairs Specialist for Orange County Sheriff's Office in California. Now before we get too into our exploration of social media, we have a few housekeeping items to take care of. All attendees are on mute. We'll follow up uh, the webinar with all resources mentioned in today's speaker's presentation. There will be time for an official Q&A at the end of the presentation, but feel free to use the question function in the control panel to submit questions throughout the presentation. Our speakers will try and attend to them as they speak, and of course, they'll answer at the end. Speaking of our agenda, we have Sophia starting us out and followed by Archive Social CEO Ray Carey speaking on the legal policy and records of social media and I will be your moderator throughout this presentation. A little bit more about our speaker. Sophia is part of the public affairs team at the Orange County Sheriff's Department in Southern California. Since 2017, she has managed the department's social media accounts, oversees over 100 secondary accounts, and creates social media strategies focusing primarily on the department's engagement efforts, as well as building community support. Welcome, Sophia. Hello, thanks for having me, guys. All right, and Sophia, you should have the screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, we can. We got it. Awesome, cool. All right. So, all right. hi again. I'm Sophia Champeau, um, and I oversee all of our department social media here at the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Uh, Sophia? Um, I have, yeah. Uh, you are in full presentation mode. Um, can you make that full screen for us? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Sorry, I never do this on my... Oh, I think I have my screens switched. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. There you go, almost. What the heck? I'm sorry, you guys. I always hide presenter view. No? Uh -oh. I think it's all right, though. We can, um, uh, we can certainly still see the slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Show screen. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. I see, I have dual screens, and so I'm not sure which one is like my main screen or not. The one with Merry Bright Christmas just showed up, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> but this is perfect. Thanks. I think we have, a, uh, we have a good view, and uh, if there's any small font, I'm sure you'll read the, uh, uh, just read the, read the comments, but we're, we're keeping up with you fine here. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. Um, all right, so a little bit of background about me. I've been with the department for about two and a half years. 
Um, and I helped build our social media presence basically from the ground up, my team and myself. So a little bit of background um, of our agency. We are quite large. We have approximately 4,000 people that work for the department, 28 divisions in total, four jails, one's under construction currently, 16 contract partners that encompasses 13 different cities, um, or how typically people would know them as like police departments, three different harbors, John Wayne Airport, the Crime Lab, the Coroner Division, and much more. So since we are such a big agency, we do have a lot of social media accounts. This is kind of just a map to show you um, how vast of an area we cover. There's about 3.4 million residents in Orange County. Um, so with that being said, each of these cities have their own accounts. So it's a very different yet similar audience and they have very different problems for their social media. So here's a little breakdown of uh, our division. We recently became our own division, which is very exciting. We have um, a lot of support from our sheriff and executive command, which I know is not everyone has. So we're very, very blessed to have that. Um, we merged with our community programs to create our public affairs and community engagement division. So we currently have a director, a community relations manager, a backup PIO, a community engagement sergeant, a PR manager. She's currently my boss. And then we also have a video unit and a graphic design guy. Um, our division oversees all of our department social media as well as our traditional media, um, internal and external communication. So let's jump into how we organize our social media accounts. So like I mentioned prior, we have about 4,000 employees and it breaks down to just about half foreign and half professional staff. Um, so this makes up just over 100 social media accounts and approximately 60 admins. So for our department, some of our admins are sworn and some are not. It's kind of, it's a little bit less than half and half with it weighing a little bit more on the professional staff side for um, social media admins. So we break down our social media pages into two different categories. The first category is the main account, and this one that our division manages and where kind of that breaking news and PIO information comes from. And then we have a secondary account on the right. We do make certain accounts mandatory to have as part of our department's communication strategy. And like I mentioned before, the, um, the cities, that's actually mandatory for them to have their social media accounts to keep their cities um, up to date on communications. But any other account is not mandatory and it's kind of up to their you know, chief or up to their sergeant, whoever's kind of overseeing that division, if that makes sense. Um, so branding is something that is extremely important to our agency. It's for reliability and clarity. Um, I just attached a screenshot here of um, a majority of our accounts. They all start for us with at OCSD, stands for Orange County Sheriff's Department. Um, we have the cities right here. We have other divisions all throughout. Um, so we monitor and oversee all these. But if we have someone who, you know, let's say lives in one of our cities and they type in at OCSD branch of Santa Margarita, then they can pop up and see, you know, our canine account, other cities, uh, the harbor, if they frequent the harbor often. So we, we try to make it really easy for our community members to find us on social media. So starting a new admin on the right foot. So this is where we really get into our training. Before someone in our department can even be an admin for a social media account, there are a few things that they have to do. If, they, if there is currently no account that they want to create one for their division, we actually have a very lengthy form that they have to fill out detailing what, uh, why they want to open the account, complete with an area for them to create an example content calendar. Once the account has been approved by our division or one of the management here, then there, uh, there comes some training as well as the signing of an authorization form. That form basically spells out that they understand the social media policy as well as the style guide that we have provided for them. If they wish to have more one-on-one -on -one training, if they're not familiar with any platform, if they don't even have a Facebook or something like that, then we then schedule another one-on-one -on -one to really um, give them all the skills that they need to succeed. So I'm just gonna read these bullet points one more time because I know my screen's a little bit smaller. So requesting an account, signing of the authorization form, like I said, it's really important to hold them accountable, clearly define their role as an admin, define the expectations of them with that style guide, with that policy, keep communication open, make sure that you're a resource for them, and then to go over the social media and policy 
and style guide um, in great detail. Okay, is it really hard to read these bullet points for you guys? No, no. no we see them. Okay, okay. Yep. okay, good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> All right. So during the onboarding training, we clearly let them know what we expect of them, of the account, and what best practices to make them successful. We deep dive into our policy and social media style guide, as I mentioned before. It has a range of topics and best practices that they can continue to re refer back to um, once we're, you know, once they've kind of are on their own. We provide the login information, or excuse me, if, if they create an account, Sometimes admins don't listen to you. So let's say they create an account without filling out that form ahead of time. Um, we clearly define that we need to maintain all of that login information here in public affairs. Um, and that's not only, you know, to kind of CYA for us and for them, but it's also if um, something is posted and we need to take it down right away, like an officer safety issue, um, we kind of just explain all of that to them. You know, we're not going to do anything without you knowing or, you know, go behind your back at all. It's just for safety purposes to cover everyone. Um, obviously, posting regularly. If they're going to have an account, they need to be responsible for it and maintain that account. They can't just post once every month and expect the community members to come visit their page for information. If they're not posting, people are not going to come there. Answer comments and messages. This one's really big, especially for me. It's not something that we can make mandatory since it is an auxiliary duty, but we really instill in them that they're not going to be successful if they don't answer what their community is saying. And then keep community apprised of important information related to law enforcement and crime. Um, so a lot of our cities have crime prevention specialists who actually their whole job is to, you know, educate the community on how to keep themselves safe. So we really show them that Social media can be an extremely helpful tool for them um, when they're providing as much messaging to their community, excuse me. So for our agency, it's equally as important for us to clearly define what they cannot do. I almost think this is more important than what they can do. So they cannot change the email, password, or phone number associated with the account. Um, you know, kind of back alley trying to get us out of the way. They cannot promote any political messages. This is really big for our city accounts. Um, you know, we can absolutely follow or like a certain mayor that's currently in office, but any kind of election or anything like that, that's not our place as an agency to promote or, you know, anything like that. Allow an admin who has not undergone training to operate an account. When we do our onboarding, we instill in them that, you know, if they haven't signed that form or if I don't know who they are, they should not be allowed to access the account. We had a problem with this. We have a couple canine accounts. We actually had a problem with someone's daughter posting on the account. That is, violates our policy. They have to be working for the department. They have to have gone through training and they have to have signed the authorization form. So that's something that we definitely drive home. Block or mute users from following the account. We are actually, I talked about this a little more, but um, legality is a really big um, issue, not issue in a negative way, but something that we take very seriously here. Um, hence why we have, you know, all this archive social and all of that kind of stuff um, to really keep us safe. But we instill in them that we're not going to violate anyone's rights. And if they have a concern, like per our policy, if they have a concern that it should be deleted, to come to us and let that be our decision so that they don't have to take on the responsibility of that. Um, post photos of inmates, victims, or children. This is special to us because I know we're a law enforcement agency, but actually um, for inmate photos, it, even a booking photo, there's a whole process. And so we find that if we explain all of these things to them and they understand sort of why they can or can't do something, um, it makes them feel more comfortable of why they're not doing it and why they should not be doing it. Posts immediately following an officer-involved shooting or city-wide event without authorization. This is also very big for us. While we're, we know they have, a, you know, their own quote-unquote voice as a page, it's really important that the media messaging is coming from the main account because that is the sheriff's voice and tone. Uh, we find when we tell them why they can't do something, we get a lot better of a response rather than just saying, don't do that. Sophia, have you found when you're training folks that, uh, that they understand that this is sort of public record? Um, that, that, no. uh, <laughs> how, how does that go during the training? Yes, yeah, so we have a whole section um, in our policy and in our style guide about legal issues. And we 
I like to drive home to them that everything, you know, on their work phone, everything on social media is PRAable. So, you know, just as they would be careful with how they say things when they're being recorded or anything like that, it's going to be the same exact thing on social media. And I always also remind them that they're not just talking to one person on social media. There's a lot of people that are seeing that comment that they might not know who they are, but it might end up being the mayor or the, you know, neighboring city mayor or something like that. Um, so we also have had actually instances where we have used archive social to pull um, certain things for depositions and things like that. And so we reinstall them that this does happen to other accounts. We do run into this often. So this is why you should take it seriously. It's definitely a large um, portion, basically right before we go over the policy with them. Great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, all right. So when it comes to media inquiries and posting media related information on our secondary accounts, these three are off the table unless it has come through our office and we've get, given like an authorization basically through our PIO. Um, so emergency situations, and I have a couple of examples on the next slide, wanted or missing, line of duty death and officer involved shooting. And these, all three of these are definitely like a stay in your lane kind of situation. We don't want a neighboring city to release something for another city or there might be something going on behind the scenes that an account needs to wait before they put something out because the information might be wrong. Um, and this is something we drive home just as much as we drive home the legal issues. Um, and we've had, you know, with anything, we definitely have struggled with it with some accounts more than others, but it's something that's a, a continual conversation because it's also hard to know, you know, what is newsworthy sometimes. Um, but things like a bomb or a baby being born are always going to be newsworthy. <laughs> um, so with that being said, we remind them that anything they post on their social media is fair game for the media to pick up, and they absolutely will. Any post or tweet they push out is an official statement on behalf of the entire department, and that's a lot of weight and should be taken really seriously. So like I said, that's a, that's a really important um, point that we drive home. We also remind them that that's why we have these policies and guidelines in place to help them stay within their lane, but still get out the relevant information that their community is looking for. During breaking incidences, we actually send out a quote unquote pause your file, um, pause your social media email, and we also do other follow-up emails with them, like you can resume as normal, or please repost or reshare the official statement, don't share any additional information, um, even though you might think it's relevant. Because for us, especially as a law enforcement agency, investigations have to look at everything before it goes out. So we really don't want to compromise an investigation because a social media admin wanted to add, you know, there was two victims instead of one, and that wasn't accurate or something like that. Um, so here is a screenshot. This is just an example of something coming from the main account and then our secondary account sharing it. So on the left is um, we had a bombing in Aliso Viejo in May of 2018. I'm not sure where everyone's from, but it was pretty big news here. So maybe you guys have heard of it. Um, so this is what we had pushed out or our PIO had pushed out. And then to the right, you can see the city that it occurred in. Can you guys see my mouth? Yeah, we sure can. Okay, perfect. Um, so you can see the city had just quote tweeted an update. And since it was kind of more specific to their city, they also included the, you know, wh what roads were closed. That's obviously super relevant to the people, you know, in the city of Aliso Viejo. And then they kept the same thing, just retweeting and resharing. Go to the next one. Um, this was also a pretty large incident that happened in January of 2018. Blaze Bernstein, he was murdered. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but as you can see on the main account, we had updated the community members, you know, we're still looking for him, he's still missing, and then the city of Lake Forest um, reshared, excuse me, Lake Forest Police Services <laughs> reshared that information. So really simple, didn't share any more information than what we had already put um, in there. So this is a quick, we, we were chatting prior to the start of this uh, webinar, and I just pulled this quickly from our social media style guide. I know we're talking about voice and tone, um, and I have mentioned before that the cities do have their own voice, um, but it needs to stay consistent with the department. So this is something, like I said, we're very clear with them what they can and cannot do. 
So the sheriff's department voice should be clean and playful humor. Responses should be upbeat, optimistic, and positive. Avoid being sarcastic or mocking. That's extremely important for our agency. We, you know, we're, we're not here to make fun of people or anything like that. We're here to help them, and we can still have a sense of humor while being respectful. Um, so I just wanted to quickly pop that in there. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, of course. So how we go about training our admins. Well, we ask them what they want. We try to send out surveys and then train on a quarterly basis at minimum. Our surveys have an array of questions and topics that they can choose from. Um, we even have questions about what days and times work for them for training because we want them to succeed and we want them to be there. Um, when things change, we also host what I like to call like non-mandatory mandatory meetings. Um, so for example, we're hosting another one this January. We have some um, social media policy and legal updates about PRAs and like evidence logging and things like that, that we want them to know so that they can protect themselves and our agencies, and excuse me, and our agency. Um, other trainings that we've hosted have been about like, for example, Instagram stories, Canva, InShot, video editing app, things like that. So this is just a screenshot, an example of um, the kind of responses we got. This uh, survey, I don't think got as many as we would have liked, but. So be a resource for your admins. I know I've touched on that, but I really believe in this. Um, we utilize our intranet to host any trainings that we've already done or any how-tos that we've already created. I find that um, the ones who can't usually make the trainings or work nights, like I said, some of them are actually deputies, can still access the same helpful material, but on their own time, like after they've written their reports or anything like that. The next bullet point is key for how we communicate as an agency. We make distribution lists. So this not only saves time and ensures that all the correct people are getting the correct information, um, but it also actually helps with passwords. So for each account, we have a separate email address, and this email address is, is a distribution list to all of the admins on the account and supervisors. So I'll pop in a quick example. We were talking about the city of Elisa Viejo and that bombing. So that email address is avsocial at ocsd.org all the admins and their city chief ha gets any email that is sent to that. So if there's a suspicious login, if someone changed the password, everyone that should know, everyone that's an admin will then receive an alert and then we can update them. Here's the password, here's why we changed it or anything like that. Um, if you have problems with people changing out contact or password information, this will help you out. This is actually how we went roundabout because we had a couple accounts that were doing this to us. Um, you will get emails when the people change the password, and you can easily de detect if people are trying to hack your account, too, which actually recently just happened for us. So be consistent. Communicate with your admins often. You want them to come to you with the good and the bad. And they won't come to you with the good if they don't come to you with the bad and vice versa. We always try to also package up content to our admins on a monthly basis. Sometimes we may fall short. We, we at least try to give them a starting point of what to push out there on their social media. So for example, we have a content calendar that we provide, um, provide for them, giving them like a heads up when we'll be posting something that they should reshare, or we give them branded safety tip information that they can share throughout the month on their own time. This is extremely helpful for the mandatory accounts as it provides them with really relevant branded content on the regular for them. So they're not constantly searching for it. So our approach is very multifaceted. We want to set them up for success, partner with them for learning and growing opportunities, give them the tools that they need, as well as be clear about what they can and cannot do, but also why, and let them know that there will be mistakes, but we as a division have their back, and the sheriff and all of our command staff also understand that mistakes are gonna happen, and they're okay with this learning and growing process, and so we're encouraging them to be that way too. So to recap, we want them to have a voice we want to prepare them, we want to empower them, we want to train them, but we also need to trust them. And I'll just close my presentation um, by leaving you with a quote from our under sheriff. You promote what you permit. If you do not educate your admins or call them out when they have crossed the line or given them the guidelines of what to do and what not to do, it ultimately is your fault as the person who oversees your social media, or excuse me, your department's social media. Having those tough conversations with your admins is not easy, but it can save you headaches and headlines in the future. That is excellent, excellent advice, uh, Sophia. You know, having to organize 110 accounts making sure that when people see that Orange County 
uh, logo, they know who they're going to talk to and making sure that everything is proper and they can have that trustworthy engagement really is depending upon everything you've worked on and making sure that that voice is consistent and making sure that they can trust what's on the other end of that screen. So thank you so much for your advice. Uh, talking a little bit more about that voice and making sure that voice is protected, we have our next speaker. Ray Carey has worked with some of the biggest voices in the industry from Chili's to Land O'Lakes. Uh, Ray has advised some of the biggest and largest brands on how to use their social media effectively, including McDonald's, Kroger, PepsiCo, and British Airways. And at the core of his experience, whether that be from slicing roast beef as a teenager to working with some of the world's largest brands, is focusing on effectively engaging customers and communities in meaningful two-way relationships. And to give his perspective on using social media effectively and safely for government entities, we have Ray Carey. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Sophia, I think it's uh, thank you for volunteering your time uh, for the community. We all want to get better. Uh, uh, at this, and you are doing this at scale um, that uh, that a lot of folks uh, hopefully have in front of them, but haven't reached yet. So uh, you've already uh, knocked into some of these hurdles and then found ways to jump over them. Uh, what I have here in my notes is takeaways. It's very, very similar to the work that I did with big companies, with PepsiCo or McDonald's. Is uh, uh, I had I heard four things, and so I, I hope these are uh, the things that take away is that to be effective, you have to be timely, relevant. Is really what I have, and that's the way to be effective, you know, fundamentally. Now, on top of this, we are in a regulated industry, right? We are sitting here uh, uh, doing this as government officials, as superintendents of schools, as uh, town and municipal clerks, and so uh, there's uh, a, a risk where, unlike a potential uh, 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 enterprise, uh, you know, British Airways uh, or others, uh, what we are doing collectively in this industry is public and permanent, and so I love the the focus in additional, not how to just be effective, right? Timely, relevant, two-way with the right tone, but also how to train folks. And the idea that you're not just doing training, set it and forget it and everything will work out, but ongoing training, um, uh, reach out uh, to people and then also the oversight. So I think that's really, really powerful is that it's one thing to, to ask folks to do it, but with uh, 50 to 60 different people publishing on 110 different uh, 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 channels for 13 different uh, cities and voices. Uh, man, you got your work cut out for it. And it sounds like you have a really good policy um, uh, to do that. And then you also focused on the prohibitions, what not to do. And, and fundamentally, the reason for this is one, uh, we are not ourselves. We are representatives of the cities, uh, of the entities, of the uh, agencies uh, that we promote. And so uh, in doing that, uh, we, have to, we have to remember that it comes with a higher level of responsibility than as a private citizen or, you know, frankly, as a, uh, uh, a, as a corporation. So I'm going to drill a little bit into that. Uh, Jessica, you can hit the next slide for us. Um, and to help people that are starting out here, um, I kind of have a drill down approach to most of the things that I do. You start wide, you know, and, and then you get narrow uh, uh, in execution. And the first thing is to start with your state. So um, if you're beginning at this and you're really trying to worry, you know, it, it, that's true for California, but is it true in Texas? Is it true in Minnesota? Um, I'd invite you to get to this uh, URL, um, the bit.ly right there, SM Public Records. If you cut that and paste it into your browser, it's going to take you to a website. And the public records laws for all 50 states in the union uh, are there. You can read them. Now, the first thing I would say is starting wide, those public records law don't specifically cover electronic uh, communication and then don't oftentimes don't specifically cover um, social media within that. Many of them date back to the 70s and they really just govern the content, not the channel and what has to be retained, uh, what has to be made public, uh, what do you have in different states called the right to know laws. And so um, you can link, you know, you'll link to those, click on it and start with that. Also, what you're going to see on that page is if you do another click down, uh, is guidance. So there are many states that then take that broad um, uh, public information and records retention laws and then give guidance specifically to electronic communications like emails and specifically to social media depending on the state. If you click the slide for a minute for me, Jessica, then uh, an example of this is in California. Uh, Sophia uh, is uh, calling in today from uh, sunny Orange County, a little bit nicer, I'm sure, than it is in Durham, North Carolina, but we don't have it bad today. And um, uh, specifically within California, 
uh, their records guidebook for the state. This was in 2015. So in the grand scheme of communications, not that old, although I think they were probably on the forefront, they really called out specifically that social media is uh, an important part of the record keeping system in the same way that is email. So remember, it's not necessarily the uh, channel. If you have to record it in email, if you had to record it, um, uh, if it was a phone call, if you had to record it as a text, it's the uh, content, not the channel. If you had to record it because it came by carrier pigeon, uh, if you need to record it and keep it, you need to keep it is what uh, state guidance will be. On that bit.ly, you can get whatever state guidance and we have, uh, there's more in-depth state guidance for some states than others, but what is available, we've made uh, available on that resource if you need it. So coming in from law to guidance, the next thing, and, and Ali talked about it, is policy. So uh, if you have your own policy, then the question is, is your policy in line with your state guidance and your state law? Uh, if it's not, we're happy to sort of talk through that. Um, if you don't have a policy, you can contact us and we have draft policies. Um, there is a link on Sophia's LinkedIn or you can ask us and we can uh, get you her policy um, uh, as well. So it asks you to have a, you know, have a policy, not just around how your records retention, although that's an important piece of it, but really a policy of what it means to engage. Um, if you click the next slide, I wanted to dig into really, and you can click the, uh, the bullets in there. Um, if you have an understanding of your public record law and your guidance, you have a policy and a style guide um, uh, that works, what can still happen? What's really happening out there? And, you know, the biggest issue here around records retention and the risk so of using this powerful tool, this two-way communication tool that can help you solve crimes, that can help you engage with your citizens, help you understand where you need to get the trash picked up and what voters care about, um, help you talk to your students at schools, it does have a potential downside. And that potential downside is if used incorrectly, if people are not on mission and on message, then you can run into some issues. So here's an example. This was in uh, Hunt County, Texas, and uh, the sheriff's office uh, was sued because they had somebody delete some uh, comments off the Facebook. Most policies uh, that we've worked with really discourage deleting because it is public and persistent, even though you want things not to be on there, um, it happens. And so, um, uh, you know, a citizen was able to uh, sue Hunt County and say, look, you remove, you violated my First Amendment rights by taking this down. So uh, this was an issue, it was settled out of court, but it was very expensive. And this is happening really all across the country right now. And I would say there's citizen actions groups that are making this, um, I would say more prevalent than it has before. I think we have another example. I don't want to uh, freak people too much out around uh, what's going on here. Um, this one's in uh, Minnesota. This one was sued for $1,000. We're typically seeing these be more like 35 to $70,000. Uh, but again, this is a constituent that said, uh, look, you blocked me. So this wasn't just a deletion. You blocked me from your social media site. And uh, people really either weren't uh, educated on their policy or practicing their policy here. Um, and if you're not able to restore that in record retention, um, you can't even have your day in court. The big issue here isn't, in my mind, so much is it deleted or not. I mean, that is a problem. The problem is if you can't recover it, maybe it was deleted, it was objectionable, and you can say, Here's following our policy. Our policy does say that we can hide or delete objectionable content. If you can't reproduce it and it's gone, then you have the problem of you don't even get your day in court. And that's where these things are getting settled out of court because um, people can't produce it to actually have the conversation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how things get deleted. Um, oh, go uh, two slides down for me. Just go down one more time. Because I think the, uh, oh, keep going. There we go. Uh, sorry, we got a lot of builds in here. This is the one I wanted to talk about is because I think uh, if um, you follow, follow Sophia's um, uh, policy, you can say, look, we're really going to drill in and train folks um, not to delete comments, not to have uh, sort of editorial comments and to act rightly. Um, Sophia, is that what is your policy on deleted comments in Orange County? We we discourage it basically completely unless it has any sort of like officer safety issues then our admins are allowed to delete that right away if it's something that you know may violate our policy but we think that is kind of questionable like legally we'll, we'll typically leave it up 
leave, leave it up. And then, um, so the issue comes, even if you have people following that, that policy, what we have seen is unlike um, uh, a text message, unlike an email, that once it goes from the creator to the sender, it's the chain of custody has changed. The chain of custody in social media is shared. It's fundamentally a different channel. So the same thing that you'd write in an email, the email goes in, you say, I have a records retention. Well, here, here's an example of Sabrina Mickelson. She's a citizen, right? Not a, uh, not a member of the agency. And she's posting in this example, you can read it. It's relatively small font. Uh, she posts that, uh, why did you need my social security number when I was trying to get a hunting license for my children? And, uh, and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife comes back and says, yes, in fact, we need this. Why do we need this? We go back and forth. We have a conversation. Looks like the, uh, uh, the, the um, social media manager did a great job, didn't ask for the social security number, you know, followed policy here. Well, later, if Sabrina decides to delete this comment or delete from social networks, all of this goes away, including what the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife said. And so if she says, you know, uh, uh, my social security number um, was, you know, was gone. Um, uh, I was asked for it by the Oregon Fish and Game. Uh, the Oregon Fish and Game can't go and say, look, we followed policy and procedure. So the issue here is even if you can train your folks not to delete sensitive content, or if you need to recover sensitive content that they delete, you can do that. The big issue is everything you comment that a citizen comments on they're in control of your records retention. So this is where we really see that issue. So um, uh, coming back a little bit, so uh, does, uh, so to see, does this actually happen? So that was my big question, which is, you know, how often uh, is there content out on social networks that ends up being deleted that could be, uh, you know, uh, could be um, needed to be produced in a records request? So we took 500 of our agencies over a year that did about 10 million social media posts across 2018. So we took all of those posts. We then waited till, I think it was May or June, it's in here, uh, May of 2019. We looked back at the archive and said, how many of those comments were there? Of those 10 million comments, three quarters of a million, that's that red number right there, 758,000 were now deleted. And so uh, that was an average of about 1,500 deletions per public agency or about 126 per month. Now, the big issue here is um, when you have an event, uh, uh, like Sophia talked about several of these events, um, it's not 126 per month between nine and five, evenly spaced in a way when you can screenshot them and hide them away. What happens is, you know, what was your comment count, um, you know, Sophia, when, uh, when you had some of these? Uh, you know, some of these bigger uh, issues. Did you have a lot more comments around events? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so this wasn't, you know, th this wasn't even throughout the month. So all these deletions happen when you have a big event. That is also when you're likely to get the freedom of information and the right to know requests. So all this stuff goes down in the crucible when you have, uh, you know, a natural disaster, an emergency, um, sort of a big event. And that's when it's crazy. And that is likely when you have to produce this content. And if it's deleted, then you ne will never know, did, you know, said sheriff follow the policy or not? We don't know. And usually that ends up getting settled out of court. So this is a way that you can use that as a training opportunity if somebody stepped outside a policy, or at least you can have it and understand, you know, why they did it. And either, uh, again, use that as a training opportunity or use it as a way to amend the policy right, if things change. So this is happening out there sort of every single day. Um, hitting up the next slide. Um, oh, we're back on my slide I already did. So this is if, um, if uh, folks are sort of aligned with as people are testing these policies, you need some sort of system. Um, there's really three ways uh, to go about this. I think many of the folks on the phone probably know this. The first is you could rely on the social networks. So I'm gonna go back to the social networks. I'm gonna see if they're there. And this generally works except for the three quarters of a million deleted comments here. Um, it's also difficult to search. Um, you can take screenshots. Uh, it's really limited. Um, uh, it will, if you happen to catch the deleted item right before, so if you really, really small volume, uh, maybe that works. It's unclear to me yet. 
It hasn't been tested in court because you don't have kind of a system um, that's uh, you know signed and exported to do that um, uh, to take screenshots. Or you can you know purchase a system. Uh, typically costs uh, a lot less than you would think, but a system that essentially not only is just screenshotting all of that. It's not screenshotting. It's actually taking it out of the back API. It gets the metadata and then we can create recreate that for you. So that's that next slide. If we hit slide 16, there we go. Is it's not only important to be able to find it, if you just screenshot it, you have to be able to search on everything within each post. Then if you find that, um, that result, the next question you get in that FOIA request, uh, in that public records request, really is can you put it in context? So that's the comment, but what was it in comment to? And so this really saves you uh, time in not having to um, uh, do multiple searches, multiple requests, you can actually reconstruct what actually happened at that time so that all the people that are making that request that are going to adjudicate whether this was right or wrong have all the information that they need, you know, sort of fundamentally. So um, I didn't want to just leave with, uh, uh, you know, difficult cases that ended in, um, uh, that ended in, uh, 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 you know, lawsuits and law settlements and, and loss of taxpayer funds. Um, there's good stories too. Uh, you guys might know right now that we're calling from Durham, North Carolina. It's our, um, our hometown. And uh, with Durham, they've uh, been a customer for some time. We had a big um, uh, uh, sort of back and forth around uh, Confederate statues. Uh, should they be up? Should they be taken down? What's going on? Very, very involved in social media uh, across, across the state. And, you know, the agency was um, served public records requests multiple times. And now the discussion can be, is this right or wrong? Should we do it or not do it? The discussion isn't what did people say about it? How did people respond? Um, you can have that issue gets resolved, not um, whether or not you have the information, whether or not, um, you know, uh, uh, somebody's trying to hide the ball, right? Really, the question is um, the legitimacy of the conversation um, is really what, what, what takes place. So, you know, with that, I think we got some uh, uh, great questions I know you have about, um, you have for Sophia about, you know, how to train your voice and how to train your folks. Um, but uh, first, I want to just make sure that I think we're going to put up a quick poll, right? And if you have questions for us, um, when you look at, if you have questions about uh, what's going on in your state, um, if you have questions about uh, the policy in your state, if you want to know what your neighbors are doing, uh, we got 2,000 folks using this across the country now, so we can put you in touch with one of your neighbors. Uh, Sophia has kindly um, uh, uh, said that she's happy to uh, have you folks uh, uh, request um, for us to put you in contact with her. She has both these policy uh, as well as her style guide that you could use as a starter kit. So if you've got um, any questions for us, uh, we're going to go ahead and launch the poll. Right, we launched in the poll. And here you go. If you, uh, as I said, understand public records, you want to know about what your neighbors are doing. Um, if you want to hear about records requests within your state, because it is relevant, this, these are state by state, uh, or then learn best practices, or if there's anything else that we uh, want to do. So with that, I will, um, uh, I'm going to start with some of, the, um, uh, some of the questions that got sent in ahead of time. We'll leave the poll up uh, as we're answering this, so you have time to go ahead and fill these out. Absolutely. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, Sophia. Some great advice on how to not only use social media for a team, but use social media safely and make sure that you are compliant with any of the laws in your state. So let's go ahead and jump into some of these questions. Uh, my first one is actually we got uh, for both of you. What materials have you found most helpful in creating an impactful strategy? Sophia, if we can get started with you on answering that. Yeah. Um, what materials? I would say I'm, I'm part of a government social media group online on Facebook that is so helpful. It's, I always, I never want to like recreate the, re, the wheel. And so I think um, all of the resources they have on there is so helpful. The conferences, um, the GSM con that I've been to is so helpful, um, as well as just talking to people like other peers that have had success and why. Um, I, I just find I learn learn best from the examples of others so i'm gonna i'm gonna go with that <laughs> fair enough great yeah i uh, echo uh, gsm con uh we've been a long supporter we're gonna uh, uh, be there again i mean that's a great place where people are beating and swapping ideas uh and 
I don't mean GSMCon, just the conference. <laughs> I also mean uh, uh, the Facebook page and just sort of the members of that. Um, we are happy to be a resource. One of the things that's uh, uh, great about working here is, um, you know, our customers generally, if you're in the social media space uh, and in the government space, you're sort of a giver by design. Um, and uh, and so uh, many of our customers have volunteered to say we want to help the community and we want to be a forum for that. So um, let us know again if you want to be introduced to one of your peers, uh, because really it's like-minded people. This is a cooperative effort to make sure that we're doing things right all across the country. And so we're happy to be a honeybee for that. And I would say absolutely start with somebody. And you want to start with somebody of your similar size. And so um, you know if you are uh, Wilkesboro, North Carolina, I'm probably not going to put you in touch with. Uh, uh, Sophia, although it's great, you probably want to read her policy as a place to start um, because it's a different state. And uh, those of you who haven't been to Wilkesboro, it's not as large as Orange County, um, <laughs> I would say, in, out here in rural North Carolina. So I would, uh, uh, we're happy to be, but I would say start with a peer uh, in your state and we're happy to make those, uh, make those introductions. Great, that's great advice. Uh, next one is actually going to be for you, Ray. How realistic is the threat of a FOIA? request resulting in a legal case? Uh, I would say this is specific to states and, and as others, so I don't have a uh, sort of a magic uh, number for you. What I can say is that we have a couple of thousand customers and we do, we help our customers when they have uh, FOIA requests. And we do that a couple hundred times a year. Um, but it really depends on state. It depends if you have a, I would say a highly newsworthy incident that's getting um, uh, a lot of attention. And then it depends on your policy, your practice, your adherence to that policy and practice. And then if you're able to produce records um, is what would make it more or less likely. But these FOIA requests are happening all the time. Um, there's many that we don't see. People just go in and they use the product. They don't have to call us. But um, those of you who, who know us, we have a woman named Alex that uh, has a whole team that sits by. And if, if nothing else is waiting for people to call in and say, I have kind of a gnarly request. How do I do this? I haven't been in the system for a little while. Um, and uh, uh, they are very, very active these days. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna leave the poll up for about another moment or two. I'm gonna jump over to one of the questions that was just submitted. What is your guidance on comments on Nextdoor? Is it okay to end the discussion after it has been left open for several hours? These comments tend to require a lot more response than other social media platforms and takes a lot of time from a staff member to monitor indefinitely. Sophia, any opinions on Nextdoor? Yeah, I always, if it's something that's like escalating or anything that needs kind of more explanation, I always try to take it offline um, and kind of provide them like, here's contact number, here's an email, you know, however you prefer to communicate with us, um, here are the ways to do that. And if they continue um, to, to not kind of listen to that, I'm just, I just reiterate, please give us a call. We can, we can um, fix the issue for you. Because like I said earlier, so many people are listening and looking at those comments. And so if you're kind of co constantly being like, let's talk about it, let's talk about it, let's talk about it, it just makes that one commenter look kind of dumb. Um, and it, and it shows the other people that, your agency is actually trying to fix the problem. So that would be my number one recommendation is try to take it offline if at all possible. Yeah, I think that uh, I'll comment just more broadly on response time. Um, I would say uh, the, the, the people that get to set the expectations of response time are the collective large companies. Um, uh, this is a Facebook comment, not a next door comment, but you know, Facebook has a badge that if you typically respond in under four hours, it will give you that badge. Um, that is being sought after uh, by many large companies as they're moving their uh, consumer affairs and customer service to social channels from traditional channels. And so increasingly people are expecting phone-like service and response times. I know in our market, we're not collectively staffed to do that, but it's important for us to understand that expectation. Um, Sophia, I love your idea of trying to take it offline. Uh, typically, um, I have seen with large, you have a big drop off if you ask people to cross channels. So if someone's on next door and you're gonna ask them to call on the phone, you're gonna have a drop off. Um, but if it's an escalated issue, if it's important enough to them, they will make that. And to potentially you can, you know, as you say, stop that, um, uh, that mill from, uh, you know, from, uh, from running. I will tell you right now, we don't have, uh, 
the ability to do notifications within Nextdoor. That's not something that uh, we're able to do. Um, but on other social networks, you can at least set up notifications. So it will reach out to you and ping you with certain keywords or even sentiment if you're interested in that um, so that you know when to, uh, when to engage. Excellent. Now, our next question is specifically for Nextdoor, but I'm going to open it up a little bit. Is it ever okay to close comments entirely? Again, the original comment was on Nextdoor, but Sophia, closing comments, your opinion? I'm going to say no, because the whole point of our social strategy is to be transparent and communicative. So that would go against our strategy as an agency. Yeah, I'll try to, um, I, I, these webinars are always hard for me because uh, uh, it's not a two-way communication. It's just uh, Jessica, Sophia, and I. So I'd love to unpack this one. Right. <laughs> in terms of an okay, from a policy perspective, um, uh, in a in a uh, records compliance perspective, absolutely. In many ways, no records is a really good record policy. The issue is it's not a very good engagement policy. And I think that's what uh, Sophia is talking about, is that um, if you don't have that, when I said those four things that I took away from Sophia, timely, relevant, two-way, and tone, if you take away two-way, um, you won't be having that engagement. It is, in fact, the, the records compliance part of me says, that's great. There's no records to, you know, like, we are compliant. But I think we would have missed the prime directive, which is we do want to engage in citizen with citizens. And if we're not making it two way, that's what these platforms were built for. Um, and so I agree with Sophia's comment that uh, uh, that, that that would kind of offend the the prime directive, if you will, of why you're doing it in the first place. Absolutely, the importance of being social on social media. Oh, and we got to clarify. I asked. I got my I got my wish. Um, oh, this is uh, closing comments after it's been left open for several hours. Sophie, do you have thought on something that uh, uh, that's feeling stale? I'm sorry, say that again? You were cutting out on my end a little bit, I'm sorry. I'm on my phone. Uh, this is, um, if there's a topic that's been um, uh, commented on, but then it's been stale for several hours, do you think it's okay to close commenting then? What does your policy um, say? I'm always, I'm always gonna say no. I'm. With that being said, I know that a lot of people don't have the resources of admins to constantly be going back and checking, but just for a communication strategy and to be successful with social media, I'm, I'm gonna have to say no on that one too. Okay. Ultra. Great, what other questions? So another one that popped in earlier, as a new person, how do you shift the narrative on social media channels that has already been established prior to coming to the organization? For us, um, I think I mentioned earlier that all the cities kind of have their own um, their own personality, but it's still within the sheriff's department voice, right? So for us, if you're finding that the voice and tone that you're using isn't isn't being successful, I would say that you need to do some research on who your community is and how they want to be communicated to. If that's Facebook, if that's Nextdoor, um, things like that. Also for us, I know this might not be for everyone, but they have the support of our division as well behind them. So helping them craft kind of strategies on what would work for them, what they think will work, um, how, again, how we can communicate the way that their constituents want to be communicated to, working with that specific city, maybe in some um, instances. Um, so I would say like, how can we brainstorm how they want to be communicated to? Because clearly, in my opinion, that would be what the problem is, right? Um, because whatever voice you're using isn't working. So, yeah, I was uh, uh, doing a webinar with uh, Allie from the city of Austin um, the other day, and she walked through the process of how to get the social media team really to get consolidated editorial content. And very much it was more their users that were telling them what to say versus the other way around. And um, for sure. Uh, the more interested in that, I'd be happy to hook folks up uh, this question uh, with, with her because she had a very intentional strategy around uh, building a policy, a practice, and then her presentation was around metrics and using metrics to get uh, you know senior people in her administration to to uh, really shift that editorial to you know back to sort of the core social media team um, so that they could then have a common voice. So. Uh, I was thinking these were great kind of two steppers. That was the first one, which is what if somebody hasn't given you the ball? 
right. <laughs> right? And hers was how to use metrics to make sure that you have the ball. And I could say this one is, you know, Sophia's like, how do you hit the ball out of the park once you have it? Um, but uh, if uh, the, the questionnaire is interested uh, in following up, we have some, um, some of the metrics that uh, Allie has used within her organization uh, to drive, um, I would say visibility. Uh, and that visibility was the first key to getting editorial control. And that's the first step to making sure you can change the voice of your organization if you don't think it's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, just wanna reiterate, the best way to follow up was course you have the poll we'll be following up with you and then if you respond to the invitation for the webinar back to that email from Erica Brooks then that is a fantastic way to get in touch with one of our team members and we can answer any of your questions and then these slides and some of the resources we've referenced will of course be going to you in an email follow-up going back to some of the questions we talked a little bit about that push and pull between internal external um, one of the questions we got before the webinar how do you balance your own content strategy with the wishes of internal and external stakeholders who have their own ideas and strategies they want to be implemented so if you, if you can take this one to start yeah absolutely um that is something that we definitely have a challenge with every day i think you know every agency has somewhat of that but for us, we, if they have an idea or if they have um, like a safe, let's say it's a safety information they need to get out, like locking your cars during the holiday season or something so you don't get your items stolen. For us in our office, it's very much how can we craft this message to be engaging, to catch their attention um, and to keep them watching it so that they understand what, you know, what to do to lock their doors or anything like that. So for us, it's how can we craft it to be more interesting for our community members to want to watch it or look at it or like it or share it with their communities. Um, so if they come to us and they say, oh, we have this flyer, I'm going to say, okay, flyers not going to typically don't do well um, if you post it just as is. Can we make it a video? Would you mind either talking on camera or can I voice record you or something like that? So we kind of always take it a step more in the direction of how how can we make this effective on social media to catch our community's attention? So even though it's something that we may not want to push out, um, that's come to us from another city or another agency or something like that, we're always going to try to redo it in some way to fit our strategy and our content creation for our social media channels, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's great. I just uh, uh, called uh, uh, questions around this, uh, this last webinar we had and the good work that Allie and Austin has done around metrics. So I think she's used metrics and not just follower metrics, although that's the if you had one metric, right, uh, uh, for senior folks in your administration, it would be, you know, driving sort of followers because the reason to do this is engagement. Um, but there are um, sub metrics that you can get from each network, like engagement and impressions, and be able to really use that with folks and say, look, uh, and I think, Sophia, this was embedded in your question, which is um, that doesn't measure well because, as you guys know, there's algorithms. Absolutely particularly within Facebook, and just because you have followers doesn't mean that they're going to get your content, right? That's the second dirty little secret is that just because you said it doesn't mean it makes its way through the algorithm and gets to the page of your followers. Even though your followers might be picking up their phones 152 times a day, if you're the 153rd ranked post by the algorithm, you never see the light of day. You're not engaging with folks. And so the way to get through that you know, algorithm is to have content that is more compelling so that the next content that comes out has more compelling. So um, if you're interested in following up on, um, I would say, you know, how to ride the algorithm, right, or how to make the algorithm your friend, that is the practical advice that Sophia said, which is you know, uh, videos, audio, um, and really trying to bring those people that say, we want to do it a different way. Bring it down to the metrics and let's all agree that we want to do it in a way that actually works. And then you're, they're, uh, you're not arguing with people's opinions. You're arguing with, uh, uh, you know, how to make it effective, not my idea versus your idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now we have time for one more quick question. And we've talked about it a little bit, but what advice and tips do you have for someone that's just starting? We've talked a lot about growing and um, how to push yourself larger, but what would you say to somebody who's just starting? Um, for me, I would say look at other people's accounts. I did this when I um, I worked for another law enforcement agency, and I had done social media not for um, 
like law enforcement before. So I found a couple of accounts that I thought were just doing a killer job. Um, you know, Mountain View PD. Um, there's Cam I think it's Lawrence, Kansas PD. Looking at their examples and how they were communicating with their community and then seeing how I could kind of form that and shape that for the community that I was serving at the time. You know, I whenever I meet with our admins, I always say, you know, the community that lives in Think Money, one of our cities, is not going to be the same community that lives in your Belinda, another one of our cities. So the way that you speak to them and the way that they, you know, want information is different. So what, that's what I did. I looked at those other accounts thought, okay, how, that's really awesome. How can I do that, but make it for the people that live in this city? And then that's kind of um, how I crafted it. Because, you know, the one social media strategy for a college town isn't going to work for a town filled with retirees. You know what I mean? But, um, but that's what I did. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think uh, I could give any better advice, right? Find a peer and learn from them. Uh, you're not alone. Um, and if we can help you find that peer, great. Um, uh, GSM Con's a great place. Uh, there's multiple places to, to find peers in the network, but that's what's so great here is it's a, a cooperative effort. So uh, find somebody like you and uh, you know copy their best practices. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We are at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank Sophia and Ray again for their amazing advice. Also to all of our attendees, if you have any interest or would like more detail, Go ahead and respond back to the email invitation that you received, and we will be sure to answer you. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Thank you for having me, guys. Bye. Appreciate it.